So my name's Doug French. I studied under Murray from uh, roughly 89 to 92 or 90 to 92. Uh, next to me is Joe Becker, and you studied under Murray what years? 91 to 93. And next up is Rich. Let's preface that with a great. Don't jump ahead. Rich, please introduce yourself and say what years you... Hi, I'm Rich Tahidor. I um, studied under Murray and Hans. 89 through 94. Uh, James Young, I was there from 91 till 95. Uh, I'm Jeff Barr. I was at UNLD with Hans and Murray from uh, 89 to 95, and I took the very last class. Very that right. goes forward. Thank you. All right, great. And you recognize this uh, this gentleman at the board. His name is Murray Rothbard. And uh, as as you've heard, we all have the had the pleasure of uh, being struck by lightning, as I like to say. Um, this uh, at this conference, we are celebrating the uh, 60th anniversary of the publication of America's Great Depression. And I like to tell the story that I didn't have any idea who Murray Rothbard was when I came to UNLV. And just to illustrate that point, Murray had, you got graded on three things. There was a midterm, there was a final, and there was a paper of 10 pages, you could write it on anything, but you had to get the topic approved by Murray. So I went in to talk to Murray and I said, yeah, Murray, I, or uh, Dr. Rothbard, I'd like to write on the Great Depression. And he goes, oh, that'd be great. Why don't, uh, yeah, pull up, uh, look up Lionel Robbins, and he mentioned this one and that one. And he said, oh, yeah, I wrote something about that. <laughs> yeah, he wrote something about that. It's America's Great Depression. But I had no idea. But that shows you the kind of guy he was. If he was, if Murray Rothbard, if that had been the only thing he did, he probably would have been a little miffed that I didn't know about it. Um, but uh, he, uh, he was very gracious and uh, I have since lost the paper somewhere between, I had it in Turkey a few years ago when we did something like this and uh, I have since lost the paper, but I, but I did okay. But that is my, uh, that's my little uh, anecdote about uh, America's uh, Great Depression. So this is uh, the employee identification card if you were thinking that, uh, and this is courtesy of the archives here at uh, uh, the Mises Institute, uh, you can see Murray's signature, uh, President's signature Robert Maxim, uh, who was uh, eventually booted, uh, probably for no good reason other than uh, uh, getting sideways with the basketball coach, Jerry Tarkanian. So uh, you could get uh, sideways with pretty much anybody at UNLV, but not Jerry Tarkanian. But uh, this is when Murray started. He showed up in uh, Vegas in 1986. I moved to Vegas in 86. Hans Hoppe moved to Vegas in 86. He starts uh, January 1st of uh, 87. Now this is a grade book. And the only thing that I want to illustrate with this, and again, this is courtesy of the archives here at uh, uh, the Mises Institute, so I thank them for that. Uh, it's not the fact that I got an A in the course. As you could tell, everybody got an A in the course, uh, almost. Uh, there is a B minus and a C, and I have no idea how those people uh, ended up getting that grade, but uh, um, <laughs> Mur Murray was a notoriously easy grader. Uh, his tests were extraordinarily hard in some ways, but, uh, uh, and you'll see one of his tests later in the program. Uh, but you can see Murray, he, uh, low-tech guy, he wasn't uh, putting anything on a computer. Uh, this was his, uh, 
grade books. Now, when I went in to uh, talk about doing a thesis, uh, I mentioned that I wanted to write on early speculative bubbles. And this is what Murray would hand you immediately. Uh, whether you're writing a paper or whether you were uh, writing a thesis, he would immediately give you um, he would give you a, essentially a jump start in your research. And uh, yes, that's Murray's handwriting. And uh, uh, no, I didn't uh, save uh, any similar sorts of pieces of paper from other, uh, other instructors I may have had at UNLV. But uh, you can see uh, John Carswell on the South Sea Bubble, Anton Murphy, of course, the on Richard Cantillon, and of course, Anton Murphy is now the, the John Law expert. Uh, but this is what uh, got me off the, uh, this got me off the, uh, um, off the side of the dock in writing uh, a thesis. Now, the last time I saw Murray Rothbard uh, was in de December, um, uh, right before he died. In fact, about uh, three weeks before he died, I happened to come back from uh, to Vegas from Reno. Uh, I went up to his uh, office in Beam Hall. He wasn't there. I waited patiently and waited and waited and waited. And of course, I was used to waiting and waiting. We all were. Um, and he didn't show up. So I took the elevator back down and I opened the door and there he was. And uh, we, we went back up for a chat, and uh, he was complaining about Chairman uh, Thayer, who was his new chair, uh, Thayer. Um, and he, uh, he handed me his, uh, his employee evaluation. So you can see here that Professor Rothbard's performance in the area of teaching has been satisfactory. Uh, no uh, classroom materials, syllabi, handouts, tests have been provided. Evaluations indicate uh, performance above uh, the rest of uh, the average, but uh, um, you know, go, again, he only gets satisfactory. In professional growth, uh, Rothbard's uh, performance was disappointing uh, during the 81 calendar year. Uh, Rothbard uh, was published in one article in a referee journal. This work is in a lower level journal, not indexed by the Journal of Economic Literature. His performance in the area of service is disappointing. He seldom participates in the daily affairs of the department. So again, this is uh, the way Murray was, uh, was treated uh, at, uh, at UNLB. If, uh, Anybody is under the uh, delusion that he and Hans were somehow worshipped because they were the most uh, well-known instructors at UNLV. They were not. He gets an overall grade of a satisfactory. Uh, however, he's demonstrated only limited professional growth. Uh, Murray was, uh, as you can imagine, somewhat miffed. Uh, I asked him to teach... Uh, or participate more in de uh, departmental affairs, teach more students and be available as a role model to junior faculty. Now, this is the, uh, his response to, uh, to, that, um, to that evaluation. And uh, it's uh, funny, it's, uh, uh, his, his response is, Finally, it is instructive to compare, uh, or uh, I must say that I am one of the best known in, uh, in professors uh, throughout uh, the United States. Uh, he's published two scholarly articles, published two smaller books during the year. Uh, but I'm, uh, he does say that he wonders why Thayer states he would like me to teach more students and yet he participated in the decision this year to abolish the MA program in theory and policy. That's what I uh, took under my, uh, when I went through. And uh, 
I protest Chairman Thayer's evaluation as an outrage. This is the first evaluation where I failed to attain satisfactory to, to excellent in every category, uh, rates my work disappointing, demonstrated only thin, uh, limited professional uh, growth, and uh, I do not believe any unbiased person upon examining the record during 91 could possibly conclude that. In the words of Chairman Thayer, it is disappointing and demonstrates only limited professional growth. Of course, he's attended all the department meetings. He's attended, uh, he's kept office hours. He attended department meetings. He asked, what daily life am I supposed to be missing? The only clue in Chairman Thayer's remarks is that I'm supposed to be available as a role model to junior faculty. Apart from wondering why Mr. Thayer would possibly want someone of limited professional growth to serve as a role model, I must say that the best way someone, including myself, can so serve is to be allowed to go about his business as a scholar and a teacher without being subject to harassment. In the first year I taught at UNLV, I was happy that two of my colleagues audited my entire history of thought course, and again, I'm always available to answer questions. Surely no one can reasonably expect it to do more than that. And he goes on to mention he's the best, uh, one of the best known professors uh, in the United States and abroad uh, that was teaching at UNLV. Uh, students have come from around the country, a few that are sitting here, to study uh, under him, both in undergraduate and graduate levels. Uh, some of the best economic students uh, have been attracted here by virtue uh, of uh, Rothbard being there. It's ironic that Chairman Thayer states that he would like me to teach more students, and yes, again, he got rid of the theory and policy uh, track. So anyway, I moved to Reno. So it's not like Murray just let you go, never communicate with you ever again. I traded letters with him because he thought I'd, you know, uh, that I had made a contribution in the uh, Tulip Mania area. Um, and this was a response to some of my frustration with uh, some of the feedback I was getting from uh, scholarly journals. And, um, but I wonder what I wanted to uh, mention about this. It's also he gets into a little uh, he gets into a little gossip here, um, and uh, he says I'm not teaching enough students. Otherwise, on the other hand, Nasser, the chairman, is trying to be fair-minded. He's done a few things to offset Tom Carroll, the evil Tom Carroll, as we know. Uh, though he remains as a prisoner of the graduate economics as well. El Stupo John Brown. Uh, that doesn't mean anything to you guys, but I had John Brown for macroeconomics and others, other things. Uh, there was a bit of a student revolt. We were all going to walk out. Uh, but uh, Fiametta, who was one of our classmates, said, listen, I'm getting an A. I'm not walking out. You guys can walk out if you want to. Uh, and anyway, we all stuck it out, and we made it through. But uh, John Brown was, uh, well, let's just say he was a guy who would fill up the chalkboard with equations and get down to the end and he was wrong and he couldn't figure it out and Fiametta would go up and and uh, show, point his the error in his ways but uh, um, and he mentions the new uh, uh, a new teacher Helen Neal did any of you have Helen Neal yeah and uh, of course she's a pro pro free market uh, type uh, choice or pre uh, public choice or albeit in the Dippy questionnaire experimental ec economics variety. I don't think I've ever heard that uh, sort of uh, mm -hmm. sort of description before. But uh, yeah, Murray was very good about trading letters uh, and uh, rumor has it there is, uh, shall we say, uh, file cabinet after file cabinet of uh, letters, uh, possibly somewhere in this building. 
Oh, he does mention Perot because I asked him a politics question. And of course, he always enjoyed talking politics. And uh, I'd ask him about the debate. Uh, but what he says here, I think that's interesting. As a typical self-made billionaire, Perot refuses to take advice from media, media or debate consultants. And so he was clobbered. Uh, I think that's probably the case with all self uh, self-made billionaires. Uh, they don't take anybody's uh, advice. But he was he was certainly into politics. He was in politics that year. Um, Perot and Pat, and you know he was on Pat Buchanan's qu kitchen cabinet for a while, and then he supported Bush for a while, and it was it was really. Uh, so it was really something. So I want to go to the panelists in Q&A. These guys all have a different uh, uh, perspective that uh, they can give you on, uh, on Murray and uh, on, uh, what it was like to study under Murray. And, uh, but I want to talk to nobody. Murray doesn't get around to teach if it's not, uh, or go to the study groups that are gonna be talked about, uh, except for Rich. Uh, Rich happened to, uh, you know, drive Murray around. As uh, many of you know, Murray uh, didn't drive, didn't know how to drive. And uh, so what was that like, Rich, uh, <coughs> toting Murray around? Um, well, after the, we'd have the, uh, one of our classes, we'd have a study group every week, and I'd walk with him to my car in the parking lot, and then we'd get into my car and drive across the street a few hundred feet <laughs> to, to the Caro's uh, restaurant uh, for our study group. And um, then after that, we I would drive him home very slowly, so I wouldn't I didn't want to get in an accident with him in the car and then have that on my conscience. Um, but yeah, one, one time we were in the car and I had a the club, you know, back in the '90s to protect your car from getting stolen. It's like a, a rod. And he was like, it's like, what's that? I was like, well, it's just uh, to prevent my car from getting stolen. And he was like, son, what's still this car? <laughs> that was, I was like, yeah, it's a 1965 uh, Chevy Malibu Classic. It's a super sport. And he's like, ah, oh, yeah, interesting. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and, and then when I would drop him off at his house, well, I'd have a, usually have a question pre-planned while we're doing the short drive, driving very slowly. And then he'd thank me for the ride and he'd get out. And he knew he was not very tall, but he'd slam my car door <laughs> every time and I'd just prepare myself because it was just like quack. <laughs> um, and he'd say, bye, bye. And it, but yeah, that was my experience driving. So what was your impression of, uh, you You were in the Caro, uh, uh, study group. So this is beyond the classroom. Murray would uh, go with uh, some of these gentlemen and others, and you would go through his books, right? You had the benefit of M Murray Rothbard teaching Man Economy and State in Caro's restaurant after class, right? Do you want to come in? Oh. Um, yeah, he, he would teach, um, you know, we'd, we'd go through the books with him. And uh, usually someone would set it up and, and we would go over there and you, you, you sit there and you take classes from other professors, especially at UNLV. <laughs> and um, you just realize you're in the presence of brilliance. There's nothing else like it. There's, there's no way that you're gonna ever be able to get something like this again. So you, you, you did cherish it, and there was a little fear factor involved, too, because you didn't want to go there and not be prepared or, or say something. It's, everything you ever said to Murray was probably stupid on your part, but um, Murray Rothbard. But, um, yeah, it was, it was just an amazing experience. I never experienced anything like it. Um, I, I, you know, I went through, I got my Ph.D., and... I never came, I never experienced anything close to being in a, a setting like that with Murray or Hans Hoppe or, or anything like that. I mean, nothing close, nothing that even compares. 
So you have to understand, we had, we had the books ahead of time. A lot of times we couldn't afford the books. The books were hard to get. Um, so we had another buddy who was a copy jockey over at the local copy shop. And he'd copy the books for us. And so we'd read the books ahead of time to try and prepare for these, these, these meetings. And I was terrified like James. I never said a word because I didn't want to think, I don't want anybody to think that I was a nut or, you know, didn't know what he was talking about. But, I mean, it was just in the air. Um, you lived and breathed Austrian economics. And, yes, we all took classes, and the classes were fine. The classes were interesting. But this is where we learned Austrian economics, and, and both uh, Rothbard and Hoppe had a, had a sort of student seminar like this. Yeah, I, I went on to get my PhD here, and I probably learned more in a coffee shop and a, a dive bar than I ever learned it, and paid for in a university. Um, it's just, there's nothing to compare with. with well, thanks to some help from Susie in the archives, we have a special little gift for Richard Theodore, Rothbard's chauffeur. Um, what he may not have known is that Murray could drive. He had a driver's license. <laughs> so either he just abused Richard <laughs> or he just really liked spending time with him or he loved that car. So that's for, that's for you, Richard. Now, Joe, you were uh, not at Caro's, but I understand you were at the stakeout with, and, and Hans's stakeout was a kind of an offshoot of what Murray put together or somebody put together at, uh, at Caro's restaurant. Right? Yeah, I'm, and I, I don't remember exactly. I remember going to one meeting uh, somewhere on campus where we gathered around a table. It seems to me it was even in a different building. Yeah than Beam Hall, which is where the business and hence economics department was in this case. But yeah, certainly the stakeout. And when I wasn't playing video poker, um, I really enjoyed spending time with Hans. And he would stay till, what, midnight one in the morning. Uh, as long as the beer lasted, Hans was there. And I, uh, Yeah, this uh, is where we're uh, supposed to move on. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> so... <laughs> Who headed up these uh, either the Caro's uh, meetings? Was there a, a student that uh, kind of took charge of these, and and then either Murray or Hans would sit back and and be the grand master? Uh, how how did that work? Well, probably we owe Bud Benneman a special thanks. I think we all know Bud. He operated a body body shop and. I mean, in the traditional sense, in, in Las Vegas. And uh, he somehow sidled his way into student government and procured for us some sort of funding for this uh, economics club, which, of course, kept the stakeout activities funded. Anyone else? But it was a little bit different for Caro's. Yeah, that, that was a little bit different. Um, Scott Kiar was involved a lot. I think Jim Philbin early on. I, I'm the baby of the group. So I kind of got there last, but uh, I think Philbin was involved, Jim, Phil, uh, Jim Philbin, Scott Kiar, and then like Lee was, Lee, Lee Clody was very instrumental. You know, he'd make sure we get the copies and things that we needed. Um, but yeah, that, those were kind of the main students. I, the way that the whole thing worked was it was kind of a hierarchy, especially at the, at the stakeout. Dr. Hoppe would sit at kind of the head of the table and then Joe and Jim Philbin and uh, a couple of the other students, Scott Kiar, graduate students, would be kind of closest to him. And then it would kind of go back. And so I was always at this other end of the table and, you know, just trying to hear. But uh, you'd move up. You kind of get to move up a little bit. You talk to someone and he'd say, oh, read this, this, and this. So you go and you read that. You come back the next week. You talk about it. And then, you know, maybe you'd move up a little bit further on the table. Well, okay, read this, this, and this. You know, oh, have you read this? No, I never read that. Oh, you got to read this. You can't, you can't. And then you kind of moved your way up as you got, you know, more experience, been there longer. And, and uh, it, it was, there was a, I think it was an informal system to it all. I mean, you, you walk in, I mean, everybody, you know, has, has seen, you know, Hans, Papa and met him, you know, he can be kind of, you know, 
scary at the beginning, but yeah, he really wasn't. He's probably one of the sweetest men I ever met, he and Mark, Dr. Rothbard. But, um, you know, you just kind of get your little confidence up a little bit and then move up a little bit down the table. And uh, Richard here was, was very instrumental to me and, and Joseph here. Um, I was, you know, I was the puppy, so I got to kind of learn from them and they would give me things to read and, you know, things like that. And by the way, there was no grades given out for this. No. This is something you did all voluntarily just to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, absorb the knowledge of these guys. By the way, Jim Philbin, if you're out there, Fiametta, if you're out there, we want to hear from you because these people have, have vanished. Uh, and the first time I saw Jim Philman was carrying Murray's stool the first night of class that, uh, that, I had, that I had Murray. So I knew the guy carrying his stool must be kind of important. He was, he was in my class. So, um, so anyway, these people have vanished off the face of the earth. They're known around the, the Mises Institute. And uh, we would love to uh, we would love to hear from you, Bill Curl so, too. Bill Curl. Bill Curl was very helpful too. Okay, all right. Jeff, did you have anything in this? Uh... So uh, I wanted to go to uh, Joe on uh, you. You wrote a, a thesis under Murray, as did I. Uh, but uh, let's hear uh, your your experience. Well, I did a um, I did a law and economics thesis. I used the Austrian school to analyze a U.S. Supreme Court regulatory takings case. I regret a little bit that I hadn't gone to law school first, but um, I guess I would describe Murray as insightful into almost everything, including you know law and economics more so than just pure economics. In my case, um, he was directive, uh, but not overly so. Uh, like most graduate students, as we see in our graduate program, uh, people start out trying to explain the world. So he, you know, properly narrowed my focus on things that um, it should have been narrowed to. Um, I never felt like, um, I mean, we went through a number of iterations, as is usually the case, I think. Maybe more in my case, I'm not sure. But I never found him to be impatient or unwilling to take a look at um, take a look at subsequent iterations of what I've done as I discovered my way through the process of analyzing this regulatory takings case out of South Carolina. So I, I wanted to mention uh, we all had the experience of waiting for Murray or Hans at Beam Mall at UNLV, fourth floor. They were both on the east end. Correct. You get off the elevator, you take a right and a quick left. You look down there, you see if someone is sitting on the floor waiting for Murray. And eventually a chair would appear and you would see if somebody was in the chair. That would give you an indication of how long you were going to have to wait. And Murray wasn't going to rush anybody off. I think Hans had his office hours in the morning, Murray in the evening. And, uh, but uh, there's no reason to go to Beam Hall anymore. They have scrubbed any uh, remnants of the existence of Rothbard or of Hoppe at UNLV. The only Beam Hall is right here. And I might make the suggestion that maybe something might be able, might be renamed B Hall in this wonderful building, but you know that's just a, maybe a silly notion of mine. But uh, I think we all had that experience of waiting to talk to Murray, and as you say, he uh, at least with me, he asked as many questions as he answered. Uh, but the condition of his office. Uh, all, obviously, as someone who is uh, somewhat disorganized in my affair, uh, Murray was of the same caliber. Uh, caliber. So uh, anybody uh, spent enough time in Murray's office to uh, describe it?
Well, I, I don't know that it was altogether unlike, you know, what you sort of imagine is a typical uh, professor's office, uh, a little cluttered, stacks of books and papers, uh, works in progress. But I, I always had the impression that however much that was the case in his office, and I never visited his home, I never drove him there, um, but uh, I still had the suspicion that most of the work that he did was not out of the university office. That was just for the stuff that he needed for students at the university, but rather most of his work was done at home, and uh, story has it that that would sometimes be from, I mean, his classes at UNLV were always in the evening. Yeah. I mean, I think the earliest you would ever get to the university is maybe 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, so my understanding is most of his work was done till, you know, 3, 4, 5 in the morning, you know, get a few hours sleep before he came, you know, in at the crack of 3 or 4 in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Crack or three or four. So, so we're going to, you'll get an idea about uh, lectures and so on, but uh, just, uh, uh, and I open this up to anybody. Was it difficult to take notes in a Murray Rothbard lecture? Uh, since I have the mic, I know I'll be passing it down, but, um, you know, to describe what Murray's classes were like, I, I'd say, um, they were entertaining because it was kind of like a stand-up, you know, comedy routine oftentimes. But the problem was you were required to memorize or you were going to have to, you know, get the material down so you could memorize it for the exams. I don't remember the exams ever being open book. Um, so while it was entertaining, it was also a little bit stressful. I think you already mentioned, Doug, that there were no – there were there were books that typically – uh, the books typically assigned were probably required at the university um, for the for the program, but that's not what he taught. He taught from a, a sort of a, a stack of loosely organized yellow legal pages, and so um, very entertaining. But it was sometimes difficult to, you know, make sure you got everything down that needed to be gotten down. Yeah, <clears throat> like when I took first took his took his first class, my first class with Murray. I realized that there was no way I could take notes um, without a tape recorder because he would go on tangent after tangent, and he just, um, it was just too much information for a human to consume <laughs> a, a, um, with a pen and paper. Um, but yeah, so I would t transcribe the, the, the tapes, then I would have notes. Otherwise, it would be impossible. Yeah, I, I never worked so hard in a class in my life. I mean, I just wanted to write down every word he said. Um, it, it was... It was, I, some people have commented on his lecturing style, which I really loved. He, he would lecture on something like, you might be starting, he might be talking about some Chinese philosopher. And then he would go off on his tangent, he'd get all the way to Hillary Clinton. <laughs> but he'd go right back to where he left off. So I liked it. And, and I, 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 you know, I miss, miss, I would love to, sit there and listen to him lecture again today but i liked his lectures a lot of people didn't but i thought i always thought if you kind of realize that you know that he's going to get to some point and he's going to go off on a tangent but the tangent would, would all follow i took him for history of thought and he was he was writing you know his, his treatise on it and he followed the whole class usually there was one main thread that was involved in it when when i was take it and then when I sat in on other people's class another class later mine it was utility and he went through the history of mankind and everything anybody you know could have thought about utility and would just bring it all the way to Hillary Clinton or somebody like that and then just go back and okay, next guy and bring it off into some other thing you know here's here's how what this guy said relates to Adam Smith or something like that and work his way back and just keep going on the straight line the only thing I'll say about lectures is, and I'll talk more about this in my remarks, but um, there were people that would take the class once, and then there would be people that would take the class again and again and again. They would just sit in the class. It's sort of like a river. It's never the same river twice. You've heard that old proverb. Rothbard's classes were never the same class twice. Yeah, anybody who's read a History of Economic Thought or his, his, his History of Economic Thought 
um, were essentially follow, they essentially follow his, his notes in class. And you say it was utility for me, uh, the year I took it, it was financial, financial history, and, you know, and it's, so it's no wonder that I write a thesis on uh, early speculative bubbles uh, that, you know, that makes sense. But as, as Jeff said, uh, every, every class was different um, and uh, depending on what he was gonna focus on. And remember, of course, that's a two volume work and uh, we kind of raced through that letter that he had written me uh, very quickly, but he said in that letter, I've already, I've already written the third volume. It's just still in my head. So, um, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's the way it, uh, that's the way it was. But, uh, so, um, so we talked about, uh, you know, Joe uh, and, and Murray's help with uh, uh, his thesis. Um, Rich, you started a thesis with him, or how did that No, that I finished work? it. Yeah, I started and finished it. And then oh, okay. I, I, I didn't catch that finish part. Good. Yeah. And now you got the license, so. Yeah, now I got the, yeah. This, this is better than the diploma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More I'll valuable, say. too. Um, Maybe yeah, no, we can I, make a deal for that later. Yeah, no, I, I, I finished the thesis, and then I, um, it was in December of 94, December 94, and then I brought him a big bottle of liquor. I can't remember what it was. It was his favorite. And he was, he's like, what are you doing? I go, I'm going to go to South America for a few months. He's like, don't get killed. Don't get, <laughs> don't get killed. Be careful. I said, don't worry. I'm going in the civilized part, you know, in the, anyway. Um, but yeah, and then, the, then January, that, that was, I guess, was, was last year, but yeah. So, uh, Joe, you'd said something that you thought uh, he did most of his work at home. Did Were you, any of you at his house on Weatherford? Okay, so I'd be the only one who, who was there. I um, And for whatever reason, again, I'm, I'm the guy that showed up who had no idea who he was. But he uh, uh, invited me to a, a faculty dinner that he and Joey put on. And uh, so Joey's in the you know, kitchen cooking, and uh, we had various professors there, and, you know, they're asking me questions that I don't know the answer to, and of course, I'm, you know, I was there by myself, so it was, uh, it was somewhat uncomfortable, but again, it just shows you how magnanimous that uh, Murray was, uh, that to, to include a student uh, in, a, in a faculty dinner, uh, the letters we traded over uh, over a couple years span, um, he um, he just never. I don't think he ever forgot any of us. Um, you know, that's the that's the sense I get. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, he was always uh, he was always there. If uh, if you were working on something, he was encouraging um, and. Uh, uh, just uh, beyond uh, any instructor uh, that I can think of ever uh, ever having. And again, um, you know, to, I think the word brilliant gets thrown around probably way too much. Uh, but I think uh, the five of us have seen brilliant. And, uh, you know, it's, it's extraordinary when you get to the uh, live it over and over. So, um, anything else from the classroom? The uh, the uh, bef before we get to uh, kind of the main event, we're working up to something here, folks. So, uh, you know, don't anybody go anywhere because uh, you're going to get a kick out of what uh, what we're going to do. But we're uh, we're running way uh, way ahead. Uh, because we're all anxious and we're all talking fast, and uh, so uh, James. Yeah, just a couple things. One of the things we we're, were talking about how supportive he was. You know, I, I I didn't deserve to, you know, I didn't deserve to wash his feet. So 
I was just blessed to be able to, to, to be around him. But he was always very encouraging. I mean, if you're writing a paper or if you were, I, I had a, a newspaper column for the local, for the college paper and he would read it, you know, like it was Murray Rothbard reading my little article. And he would always come in and he would say, yeah, yeah, yeah get him, get him. And he did this, cause I, I, I guess I was a muckraker. Um, but he was always very encouraging, very friendly. He knew what you're doing. And uh, when I met Joey Rothbard, as it was after you know, Mary had passed, I walked up and I, and, you know, I, I didn't think he'd even mention me everywhere, anywhere. I walked up and I said, hi, you know, Ms. Rothbard, I was a student of your, 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 your husband's. And she said, oh, you're James. Yeah. And it was like she kind of knew me. And I'm sitting there, I... I why would Murray Rothbard be telling his wife about me? And then the last thing I wanted to do was talk about just kind of the overall atmosphere. We left out, we're leaving out a big part of UNLV and being an Austrian at UNLV and that's, that's um, having uh, Dr. Hoppe around. Um, the two of them together, there was nothing to compare to, nothing, nothing. Um, Dr. Hoppe was you, you, everybody says what they think of him, but he was actually probably the most considerate and just, he would do anything for you. He did anything for us. He met with us once a week. He, we would have, we all were part of something called Political Economy Club. And to justify our $500 in drinking money, we had to, we did more than drink with it. We made, well, Lee got us free photocopies, but we would put on events and we would have speakers. And I remember one time we had a speaker drop out and we went to Dr. Hoppe and he had a speech he was preparing to give. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he pulls a speech out of the drawer and he gives it for us. You know, not, not, not something he had canned, something that, you know, was brand new. Um, but they, I never, I never even heard of anyone spending that much time away from class, you know, outside of class with a professor. I never heard of it. I, I, maybe, maybe some older professors have done it or maybe, maybe I just didn't go to the right places. But not only did I have never heard of it, I never even, it might make some people mad. I never even met a professor that I wanted to spend that much time around, <laughs> you know? And we were just all blessed to do it. Um, in case you can't tell, we're all kind of close knit. Um, I haven't seen Richard since he abandoned me here of uh, 20, gosh, how, was it 120 was years ago, out. Tim? I was, I was here with Tim too. Um, I was kicked out. No, that, that was their fault. But, uh, you know, we all keep in touch. We all, you know, we'd love to hear from Jim Philbin and those guys we just mentioned, but, um, it was, we just, we, we had fun. We, I mean, we learned more than we would have ever learned anywhere else. When I originally, I w I'm from Las Vegas, and I was, when I got out of high school, I, I went and I talked to his, the econ department guys because I knew I wanted to be an economist before um, Rothbard and Hoppe were there. And I thought they were, they were silly. I thought that they were, they, they weren't serious people. They just didn't seem like serious people to me. I'm, I'm trying to be nice. And I said, there's no way on God's green earth I'm going to go there. And I left. I joined the Navy, and I, I, I was a nuclear power plant operator, and I got out. And I wasn't. I wanted to go to UCLA, and I was like, I was getting out, but I wasn't sure if I was going to get out on time. So I said, I'll go to UNLV for a semester, just, and then go to UCLA. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be like David Gordon. <laughs> Which I had no chance of being like, but, um, and I, I just happened to take Hoppe's class, just random, just that's the time. And once I, I, I heard the first two days of lectures where he he talked about what economics was, how it was done, I was hooked. And I had never met Rothbard, but I read him first because Hoppe had, Dr. Hoppe had made us read it, and I thought he was this giant man. I thought he was like Tom DiLorenzo on steroids. And I thought that he could just crush you. 
mentally, physically, you know, Five, intellectually. <laughs> and I was scared to death of him. And then I meet him. You know, he's a short, nice little Jewish guy comes waddling in, and he's he was he was super friendly and supportive, and it was just the whole environment was kind of um, I, I don't think it'll ever be duplicated. Uh, one of the things you asked us to think about uh, when inviting us on this panel, Doug, is whether Rothbard Rothbard was successful at UNLV, and how esteemed Rothbard was at UNLV. So. Let me talk about it, those things br uh, briefly. As far as successful, uh, I mean, great, I think, with respect to the students and and then, you know, bringing Hop in who were drawn to him there. I mean, the, he was great for that. Uh, he was arguably less successful in winning over the fellow econ profs in the department as, I mean, one only need look at that evaluation that you read from mm -hmm. to see, uh, you know, whether they regarded him as a success. Uh, this this uh, experience served me well. I had a graduate assistantship in the Center for Business and Economic Research with uh, Dr. Schwer, who's uh, the late Dr. Schwer. He died of throat cancer short, shortly after 9-11 uh, because he was in the towers across the street and managed to walk his way out of there, and we think that probably had something to do with it. But the advantage for me was they didn't talk to one another. So, and I've, I, I apologize if you've heard this story before, but because they didn't talk to one another, I became the conduit through which they exchanged ideas, which served me especially well. So, you know, we would learn something from Murray or Hans, and then I would confront the traditional economists with that principle, and of course they would say, no, that's wrong because of this. So I would, of course, go immediately back to uh, Murray and say, but they said this, and he, of course, always had a good response for them. So, I mean, this all served me very, very well. As far as um, whether he was successful, I mean, one only need look at the members of the panel. We have successful libertarian-minded attorney. We have a, a professor of economics. We have a successful entrepreneur. You were the former president of the Mises Institute. I mean, that's success the way I would certainly measure it for the students. Uh, as far as esteem, uh, I think he was held in high esteem, especially outside of the department, right? Uh, and the university, for that matter, my outside committee matter, member, we had to have one for the thesis, was someone from the ethics and policy studies uh, department. I took a, because I was doing law and economic stuff, I took some sort of a, a, a course with them, and he wanted being my outside member. Uh, some of you, probably most of you know uh, Francis Beckwith, who was in the philosophy department at the time that we were all at UNLV. Uh, he had nothing but esteem for uh, Dr. Dr. Rothbard as well. So outside of the department, certainly yes. And then outside of the university setting, I'm gonna get you to hold the mic for me for a second. Um, outside of the university setting, I mean, I was only there for a couple of years, but you know, this is the newspapers, right? Quiet revolution. We could have been the running rebels of economics. There's Murray. I, this stuff will be up here for you to look at after, if you want. We have, this was during the Milken days. Uh, there's a nice caricature of uh, Milken. And Murray wrote, the Milken was a free market genius. What I especially like about this is, you know, you know how they don't get it all on the same page. So Mil Milken was f far from a solo act. Milken, a free market genius. But you know how they shorten the headline so you can find it on the next page? Greed? <laughs> Genius. Milken was genius. No, three, bad. So, I mean, that's that's really good stuff. And then uh, I actually found an article about this article on uh, on on uh, Lisa's website. Uh, Government is self therapy. This is when Clinton came out and said, and "There's a." And Murray said he didn't. He loved the article, but he didn't particularly like the caricature of him. Uh, but. Uh, this was when Clinton came out and said, it doesn't matter if it works or not. Government has to do something. And so he said, ah, it's like hot. And so <laughs> anyway, um, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to say that he wasn't esteemed and successful, even if not amongst his own uh, midwits, you know, his, the midwits in the department. So 
That's, I guess, what I would say. Yeah, that. the point point's well taken. I, I would say that Tom Carroll, who was chairman when I was there, and then Thayer immediately after, uh, did did Murray and Hans no favors. Um, and I remember uh, I had taken a couple classes and um, was deciding what to take next, and I saw um, History of Economic Thought, 742 Rothbard, and I didn't know who Rothbard was. So I, I asked a fellow classmate, Joel Volpe is his name, and uh, he said, oh, don't take, don't take Rothbard, he's a kook. Uh, go ahead and take Carsonson, uh, you know, independent study, and you can you can get that out of the way. But you don't want to take you don't want to take Rothbard. Tom Carroll did all he could to destroy the theory and policy track, uh, along with uh, Thayer. Did you get through on theory, theory policy, or so you and I are the last two, I believe, that got through on on theory policy. I, I did. I yeah, know. yeah, I was an undergrad. And uh, I wanted to get the BA in economics and I would go for advisement to the advisor. They told me there wasn't one and the BA in economics had all the economics classes. And that would be the ones that, you know, that, that Murray Rothbard taught. And I was told there wasn't one. I kept saying, I know there is one. It's in the catalog. I looked at it. It's right here. No, 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 no. And I didn't. So I was on the BS track, which was aptly named. And, um, I found out from, from these guys through being in the political economy club, no, no, there is one, just do it. Don't go to them for advising. They were trying to, they would literally try to steer people away, both at the graduate level and undergraduate level, away from him so they could study under people who had written uh, seminal articles on pet health insurance and the economics of suntan lotion. <laughs> Well, Those are important the, works. That's not funny. <laughs> one of the reasons that was Thayer's, by the way, claim to think uh, was the suntan lotion. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the reasons you guys met was uh, uh, the university was not going to give Hans Hoppe um, uh, tenure. Tenure. And uh, uh, Dr. Yoey. Uh, uh, made it his case to uh, pursue that cause and lead a student revolt, which uh, put him together with uh, Mr. Barr and uh, Leah Glody, who's not here, and so on. I didn't know any of these guys at the time. I was a little bit in front, and uh, so we were all kind of, in a way, ships passing in the night, but uh, now we're, uh, as, as the point was made, uh, we're cl very close because, uh, you know, we were in the same, uh, I guess that saying we were in the same foxhole together isn't probably appropriate, but, uh, you know, we have an experience that uh, uh, not many people have had. So speaking of that experience, I'd like to bring up uh, Jeffrey Barr, uh, and uh, he has got the... Uh, the clothes and uh, a little surprise. Thank you again to the, to the Mises Institute for all of this. Um, Thank you. I, I want to say that I am in a very, very exclusive club. In the entire world, there are about 10 of us. I took the very last class that Murray Rothbard ever taught in his life. Um, it was the history of thought class. And I, and I want you to imagine sitting in a classroom. Imagine you're a 20-something grad student, 20-something-year-old grad student sitting in a classroom in the fall of 1994. The Berlin Wall had just fallen five years previously. The Soviet Union had dissolved without a shot. Mises had been vindicated. Bill Clinton was president. Newt Gingrich had just taken over the Congress. Um, and you've studied Austrian economics with Hans Hoppe and Murray Rothbard for years. You've attended their classes and their study groups. And I signed up for Rothbard's History of Thought. This was my first official time taking it. Now Rothbard walks in. He's a very diminutive man, as you can tell by the cutout downstairs in the lobby. Not very tall at all. He wore this shir the shirt always with the short sleeves. And he had these khaki slacks on always. And he'd kind of shuffle in. And he'd sit on a stool in the, in the middle of the classroom with a um, 
with a raised desk in the middle of this seminar room, and you're presented with this syllabus. Now, I'm going to show you this in a little more detail. This is the actual syllabus from the fall of 1994. Now, let's start with a couple of things. Um, first, note the, the time of the class, 5.30 to 6.45. As we stated earlier, Rothbard was a notorious night owl, um, which was terrible for people like me who are of larks. But Rothbard was absolutely a notorious night owl. Next, I want you to pay attention to the font. And you say, Jeff, what's so crazy about the font? Rothbard used a typewriter until the day he died. There were word processors, there were word beta word processing programs, but this is typewritten. Next, I want you to note the room, BEH 219. Now, that's Beam Hall, what Doug mentioned. Now, the room was a fairly standard seminar room with stadium seating. It probably accommodated 25, 30 students, and only five or 10 of us were actually registered for the class. People would just kind of come and go. Um, it was that kind of popular. Now, let's take a look at the outline of topics. Look how broad this is. You're going to go in one semester from the, from the Whig history of Paris, or from the scholastic tradition all the way to Keynes. Note how broad this is. This was going to be quite the survey. Now, I want you to note the textbook, he says, and we've talked about this, right? Note the phrase, there is no fully satisfactory textbook in the history of economic thought. There was no satisfactory economic thought textbook. So what did he do? He wrote his own, right? And, we, and I know now, I didn't know it at the time, um, that Rothbard was lecturing from his notes for what would be published posthumously as the history of economic thought. And he'd walk in with this little manila folder, and he'd set it down on the desk, and he'd flip through the notes and read. And his tests, as we've discussed, were comprehensive. That's, the, that's what I would say. His tests were comprehensive. There was a term paper, two, two, midter, two, two, exam, and two exams. Let's take a look at one of these tests. Here's some of the questions. And you had to pick five of the ten questions. So I just put up a couple here to, to, to give you some flavor for the... And you had to hand write. There was days of the handwriting. You didn't have a he didn't have a word processor. So what was Irving, this is my favorite, what was Ir, he didn't have any, what was Irving Fisher's theory of money and the business cycles and his policy prescriptions based upon them? Rothbard had nothing good to say about Irving Fisher, absolutely nothing. So it was, so it was phenomenal, um, again, that he would include such things. Now, I want to take you back to the lectures. There's been a lot of discussion about the lectures because Murray said that the class lectures are central to the material for the course. The readings served merely as a background material for the lectures, and he meant that. The readings were just background. Um, attendance was not required, but it was strongly recommended. Um, it is my contention, and I think that Hoppe shares this, that Rothbard was a terrible lecturer, awful lecturer, in the normal sense of the word. In other words, if you expected a professor to digest material and then regurgitate it back to you, that was not Rothbard. Rothbard's lectures were something magnificent. They, they, they were loosely based on a topic, and then they would wander, as I said, magnificently. The margins of my notes would be filled with the allusions to, or citations that he would, he would cite to. And then also be filled with, oops, let's go back on that, anecdotes and musings. And as I say in a word, they were wonderful. Um, and we have a sample for you. As Rich said, many students used to tape record him on these tiny little micro cassettes. And what you're going to hear is from the fall of 1994, November 21st, 1994. Hasn't been heard since I was in this class. You're going to hear an excerpt from that. Now, Unfortunately, you know, the, those of you that remember tiny micro cassettes, they're not that great sound quality. So we've digitized it. We've tried to bring up the levels a little bit so you can hear it. Um, but to aid in your listening, I've got a transcription up here on the board. So let's take a listen. You're in Murray Rothbard's class, fall of 1994, November 21st. 
And we're going to start talking about the Scottish Enlightenment, Adam Smith and the Scottish Enlightenment. The university system, power structure, religious system, church, and Scotland, mostly born around 1720. The whole generation of uh, Scottish Enlightenment. And uh, the Smith is a very prominent character. Smith saw uh, many aspects of that. And the problem was it hadn't explored much because of Smithy, Smithy and hagiography. I want to stop there. We are starting with Smith and the Scottish Enlightenment. I want you to keep track of how many thinkers, how many philosophers, economists, just keep track, a count, of how many philosophers, economists, thinkers, historians, that kind of thing that Rothbard mentions in the next five to 10 minutes. Oops. Our historian, Philip, he's our if you're the wise of the saints, uh, the wise of the saints, uh, written by saint worshippers, you know, and pretty much wonderful people are. So these are the, the uh, they advanced of worship and endemic economics. And uh, some of the stuff that the advanced over the years, the great Helen Cannon, it will be the great guy, and the professor of London School of Economics, free market, hard money type, uh, many years. And he, uh, most of the free market people in England were students of Cannon, like Lionel Rollins. And our own plan is still around. I guess it's funny guys still around. Great generation of Canaanites. And he was the, he didn't write much of his life. He wrote a very little book on money and uh, some journal articles. And then he wrote a, a definitive edition of the Wealth of Nation. And that Pussy wrote a history of, history of uh, classical economic thought, something like that, uh, dealing with Smith Ricardo and Malthus. And the thing is, uh, he's a great guy, very witty and very penetrating. Unfortunately, a very critical of Smith uh, and the Patsy Obama. The problem is that with his book on history of theory, I think it's called history of production and distribution. And I wouldn't say it's unreadable. The problem is he lumps everybody together. It's not the sort of style I like. And a lot of historians before wrote that way. Oh, he still do. But they, they know that period. They, wrote, they, they jumble everything together. They include Meyer does something similar. And they, they, they might have had a topic, value theory, or entree theory, and he clearly got kind of up to the same, and, so, and you have to, instead of having, okay, this is Smith, and Cameron Smith, they didn't, they didn't do it that way, they just jumbled everything, so it's very difficult to figure out what's going on, okay, you got a clear position on any one of these guys, and very, very critical, and very critical, so, but it was sort of very ill as a dish now, the style, and the fact that, and the addition of, you know, all the nation, and then this book I recommend I write by Clark and others, great, Doug Cole wrote a great critique of this theory of value distribution. Uh, and then Schumpeter, and then but still we have a dominant Smith in geography, Smith Ricardo and all that. Schumpeter's book, I said this already, but he's, it was basically, he didn't get to die before he finished. It's basically, a, the whole book is a kind of bitter attack on Smith and Ricardo. And uh, as the themes run through, if you look up Smith and Ricardo on the index, these are the passes in them, and you get a full picture. Uh, Yeah, I'm good. You know, I'm not. 
Cincinnati, but he's like speaking for Hayek. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, Hayek wrote the third. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, 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 I
Rothbard died about 60 days after this lecture. I consider it one of the great privileges of my life to have attended this class. And I'm very happy to have shared this small snippet of that with you. Thank you. Yeah, imagine taking notes with that. And I remember the first night, and uh, again, I didn't know who he was, and people just furiously writing notes. And I gave up, you know, immediately. But uh, uh, again, my life changed forever uh, the first night that uh, he walked in the room. And he changed all of our lives and probably a few lives in this room too. We got about 15 minutes for questions, if you have any. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I remember you saying at one time that that, that that first class was in, he began his lecture outside in the hallway. Yeah, uh, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, so you got nine minutes of what would be an hour and 15 minutes, because he would immediately be talking. He would be talking when he hit the door. And when the, you know, time ran out, you know, he might stop, he might not. Um, there, somebody got a question in there edgewise, I guess, during that nine minutes. But, but for the most part, he talked, we listened. So, um, but there was no, you know, him coming in, him getting settled, him, you know. Uh, the d first day I had of, of class, it was... Uh, the Gulf, first Gulf War was on, and he was talking about the politicians, how stupid they were, uh, about, uh, you know, rationing gas or whatever it was. And it just started immediately when he hit the door. So, yeah, it's, uh, it was an hour and 15 of, of, of what you just heard. Mark? Yeah, so you know, most of you probably know Mark Shell's uh, Most of you know I commissioned Murray to write his history of thought. <laughs> Uh, that was in around 1980. Initially, I said, listen, what I want is an alternative to how runners wealthy, uh, the, uh, philosophy. Yeah, the, the world yeah. philosophy. Worldly for philosophers. Twelve chapters. Yes. Uh, start with Adam Smith, uh, end with the, uh, the 80s, bring it up to date, two canes and marks and so forth. And uh, he readily agreed. I paid $20,000 in advance. That was a lot of money that got his attention. And he said, Oh, this is what I want to do. So 15 years later, <laughs> we got through half of it. And the big joke was always, uh, Have you reached marks yet? Or even have, have you reached Adam Smith? That was the initial one. Turned out his first chapter was not Adam Smith, it was the Greek philosophers and Aristotle and stuff like that. So this would turn out to be a Schumpeterian tone. Hmm. And um, and I, I must say that uh, I was pretty shocked at his views on Adam Smith. And uh, I have my own story about that that I won't get into, but tomorrow my lecture is on the 300th anniversary of Adam Smith's birth. So uh, I know he didn't like anniversaries, but that's my topic is going to be on Adam Smith, a, a libertarian view, which is very different, as you will hear, from, from Murray's view. Uh, he's, he's created, uh, I was talking to Eamon, Eamon Butler at the Adam Smith Institute, and uh, they're pretty upset with uh, Murray on his view. On <laughs> but, but I think it's important to hear Hear different views, you know. I mean, that's that's what I, that's what it's all about, right? Well, that's right. And uh, I had heard that story uh, from Murray himself, and uh, uh, it will uh, probably not to surprise you that uh, he said, "Ah, oh, poor Skousen." But uh, <laughs> <laughs> he felt bad that he had not followed yeah. my requirements, but yet look what we got. Yeah. Is, he ran with it, and that was, that's fine. Uh, he's a guy that couldn't help himself. Hey, Doug. So, hey, yeah. Doug. So, so Rothbard used to joke. The, he, he actually used to, you heard about, you read, heard about, he, he talking about Schumpeter, and Schumpeter finished, didn't finish his volumes. Rothbard used to joke about the three-volume curse, 
In other words, these people would get through two volumes of something and then they would die and they wouldn't, and they wouldn't let their third volume get published. And so, of course, I mean, it's ironic, right, that he finished two volumes of the history of economic thought and then unfortunately died before finishing the third. So, uh, again, a member of the, the curse of the three-volume yeah, set. Absolutely. Yeah, it was all in his head and never got to paper. So, anybody else? Anybody want to know? Did he finish? Uh, how did the course end? Did you say he never got the canes? What, what actually happened? Oh, I remember him because he used to call Keynes Maynard all the time. That's how he used to he used to refer to Keynes as oh Maynard this and Maynard that. So yeah, he got to at least in the financial, uh, you know, telling of the story. Yeah, he did get to Keynes, but, but you didn't get to the Chicago. Show. No, no. So, um, but uh, we got plenty, and uh, so. How do you get it in a tangent, though? There's a lot of things they might not cover, and that's in a tangent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Doug, one of the things you asked us to research a little bit, if we could find out, and there's probably people who know this a lot better than I, but why did Murray wind up at UNLV? Do you know the, I mean, I, I found a few things, but I can Well, comment. I don't, you know, he, he, he took the SJ Hall chair, uh, we talked a little bit about it last night, um, and uh, again, this is 86, 87. Um, um, I think it was a increase in pay and so on, but I don't, does anybody yeah, really the, know? The, the, I mean, he loved New York. He, yeah, that's he true. He crazy about Beloved New York. Loved Manhattan. The, the backdrop I saw was, you know, for 20 years, he had that part-time instructor position at yeah. Brooklyn Polytechnic. Yeah. Um, this is going to sound a little bit like a plug for our own graduate school, and it probably is. But, you know, he and Mises always envisioned that there would be a graduate school of Austrian economics. And there wasn't even an economics department at Brooklyn Polytechnic. There was no major, no department. And uh, my understanding is he thought that even the social science department there was like decidedly Marxist. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising, you know, when he got the opportunity for the S.J. Hall, he departed um, Manhattan, although he was there summers and Christmases and things. Yeah. And he didn't get fired, Richard, uh, for, yeah, for leaving took, at Christmas Yeah, he took time. The, the red eye uh, the, the night of uh, his last final. But, it, it, yeah. you know, it definitely, was a, it definitely was a step up. It was an opportunity to have something like yeah. that. And then, you know, I was... Thinking about that, and I saw this, you know, this article, which we can read. I'm not going to read it now, but it's here. It said, uh, it was an article that said we could have been the running rebels of economics. And for those of you who aren't basketball fans, that was the, uh, you know, that was the, the mascot of the national championship team. And I was there for Tark's last year and um, Massimino's uh, mm -hmm. first year. So it was a very successful basketball program. So that was a compliment to say we could have been. I think what he might have thought when he went there and then bring Hoppy out that he might have thought, hey, this is, um, you know, this is the this is the an opportunity to do something that they had talked about for years and years ab about creating. Um, and one of their problems in getting the thing started elsewhere was you could find a, a donor to create the program, but the universities always wanted to control Mm -hmm. who took the place after after right and so i thought well i wonder who's got this sj hall position now and you may know because you live in vegas yeah. but i found it sort of uh, telling when i looked it up it's it's some character who figured out this is this is profound get ready folks that residential demand for water went up during the lockdown period in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's stunning insight. Um, but, uh, and, and in the letter that he had sent me, he and I had talked and he mentioned it in the letter. He wanted to even, he and Hans wanted to break away uh, from the business school and go to the liberal arts college and, and try to set this up. And so he called it the jailbreak. And, um, so he was very intent on doing it, but he 
you know, there the, was this provost and that provost that was always getting in the way of these sorts of things. Murray was, by the way, as far as uh, uh, just being friendly and other faculty members liking him, they liked him. Um, you know, he, he was, he was well-liked, but, uh, just as far as the, uh, senior management, not so much. David? Well, one of the point on why he left for Las Vegas, I never told me, he thought he was working in the context of people who didn't really appreciate his work, and so their attitude was that he was a very famous professor, and he should have brought research money to them, he said uh, their attitude was, if you're so smart, why aren't we rich? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, uh, yeah, I can, you, we can see uh, students and research money flowing into Brooklyn Polytech. But... Um, um, we could have fixed the elevator thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, he died of a heart attack. Was there any indications before that that his health was poor? Well, heart listen, uh, Murray was, uh, uh, can we say he was anti-exercise? Uh, can we say that every calorie says awe to life? Uh, yes, he said that. Um, I blame the Wonder Bread. He yeah, he liked to learn uh, Wonder Bread and uh, Stolichnaya Vodka and... Uh, but uh, again, uh, as today's standards go, certainly what he died at 66, I believe, right? It was 65, 66, 68. 68. I think that's really, it's either 68 or 69. Oh, okay. Well, to, okay. Well, all right. Well, fair enough. Um, you know, as a couple of us on the panel are, are nearing that age and, uh, so uh, that's another reason why, frankly, we're out doing this, um, because uh, uh, a lot of people in this building have, have read Murray's work. They've um, heard of Murray's work, uh, but very few have heard the story of him as a, as a professor. And uh, as uh, I hope uh, it has come across, is that it, uh, he was a profound one and an extraordinary one. Anybody else? Yes, sir. This is a question for Richard. Um, what was the content of driving with Murray, driving him home, like, and, and just for some context, like, I want to say I, I had the privilege to drive Professor David Gordon home one time. I was just laughing all the time, the jokes that he was telling me. Yeah, I, I would just ask him about just a question, and it would just be a short question, and um, I was just mostly focused on not running into any, any running into anything um because i was it's a little nerve-wracking when you're like you have him sitting next to you and you're like if he dies in my car <laughs> <laughs> you know i will I'll have to leave this the state or something um but yeah it was it just mostly asked i would ask him a question about economics or something um and he may, he might make a joke or something and then slam the door on the way out <laughs> um, say thank you yeah that's it by the way, Murray had plenty to say about riding coast to coast with David Gordon. <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe a few jokes were told during that, uh, during that coast to coast trip. So that's what I remember most of hearing from Murray uh, about those trips and uh, Dave, David keeping him uh, entertained. So. Dave, David Gordon stayed in my apartment once. Maybe you and I need to get together and compare notes. <laughs> Died on January 7, uh, 1995. Uh, I was doing a tour with the new Cato Institute building that Ed Crane had commissioned, and we were going through it. And that's when we were told that Murray had died. And let me tell you something Ed Crane turned white. I had never in my life seen somebody react in such shock. Uh, they had huge differences of opinion, but Murray Rothbard, the Cato Institute may not have gotten started without Murray Rothbard. 
and uh, they had their falling out and stuff. But you could tell from his reaction how an icon, a giant, had died. Yeah, I, I, I don't doubt it, and I, as, as we close, I'm going to take the uh, chairman's prerogative and say that uh, we hear a lot about uh, Murray's breaks with Cato, with laissez-faire books, with Liberty Fund, with this one, with that one. That is not the Murray I know. Murray was the nicest guy, and it is hard. I can imagine they... You know, whether it be war or something like that. Uh, but the idea that Murray Rothbard, you, some people will get the idea that he had so many breaks that he was a guy running around trying to pick a fight. And he was not. He was just the sweetest gentleman I ever knew. And uh, if you guys disagree, uh, say you now or forever hold your peace. With that, it is uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. It is four o'clock. Uh, we have exhausted the time. Uh, hopefully, we didn't exhaust your attention. Thanks so much. As you can tell, it, it was a time that uh, meant a lot to us, and hopefully, that was conveyed to you. Thank you. Thank you.